Hence. Now, there has been, um, yeah, kind of a small stone, uh, double story dwellings. And so if you go to a village, it's all, um, there's, there's plaza in the middle, and then there's these stone houses all around it. So we can stand up there. And then did just the general kind of sprawl. So that would be the centre of each of those villages. And then there's a sprawl of kind of. Uh, you can't get a mortgage to build on Hopi land, and um, it's very difficult to to build a traditional village. So um, a traditional house. So most of the houses around it, the people live in uh, trailers. So they kind of oh, spread out around that. So, yeah. What sort of religion do they have? What sort of religion? Yeah. It's, it would be ancestor based. So there's, um, when I talk about the dancers in the, the square, these are um, representations of what they refer to as kachinas. Katsina. Um, so there would be somewhere in the region, somewhere between three and five hundred different personalities amongst these kachinas. Uh, and they come from, you know, uh, it's quite bizarre spirits to uh, just identifications of ancestors or even their neighbours. There are Navajo Kachinas, there are you know, Zuni Kachinas, they're all coming together. Then, kind of above that, there's this level of, I suppose, deities. Um, so yes, so when we talk about Hopi religion and the fact that it's intertwined with everything, most of it is in conversing with these levels of ancestors and deities uh, for better crops, for, for rain essentially. I mean, this is the main thing, they live in the desert and they need rain to grow stuff. So if, if we can kind of build a better relationship with them, the rains will come, everybody's happy. So that would be my understanding of it. I'm sure there's a very technical anthropological term for that, but does that explain anything? <laughs> Do they celebrate seasons? Or? Yeah, yeah, they do. Um, and it was explained to me, it, it's it's kind of constant. So the life cycle, oh, let's see, how have I got it here? Yeah, I think the year is split up um, astronomically. Is that the right term? So yeah, based on the solstices and uh, the equinoxes as well. Uh, and so there would be a series of um, ceremonies that <coughs> take a certain amount of time to prepare for, a certain amount of time to enact, and a certain amount of time to recover from. And so it was always sort of spoken to me that if you are if you are hardcore enough to be a true Hopi religious person, you're either preparing for, in, or recovering from some ceremony or other. But you know, people dip in and out that some of them have been lost, you know, it has to be practical. Um, so most of it is, is adapted to work at weekends rather than on very specific days now. Uh, so yeah, it's, it's a nice creative way of, of trying to continue that, but with the realities of living in the 21st century, so. Can uh, hobbies tell a difference between New Age people and anthropologists? No, definitely not at all. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, I guess the only, you know, at the time I, I, I looked a bit odd. I had lots of earrings and... Uh, you yeah. still do. I, mean, I don't mean in terms of your appearance, I mean in terms of, you both care to get information from them. Yeah. For your own benefit. Yeah, very much so. And uh, right, um, a lot of the stuff that I worked on was, it started off as this core of looking at the relationship between Hobies and New Ages, but very soon trying to transpire it in these other spheres and looking at the way that they've dealt with anthropologists in the past. Is, is is another sort of chapter, another story, and it's quite interesting. Um, they, I was always, people knew who I was, the Hopi grapevine worked very well, so they knew I was the anthropologist, but because I also looked a little bit strange, they were quite intrigued by me. But it is, you know, um, But I mean, can they have that, can a new age person have the same reception? If they're tactful enough and, yeah, you know, respectful yeah. enough, then surely they could be incorporated very much so. I think it is, and it's that it's that fine. It's not so much the idea of New Ages wanting something from Hobie, but it's how they go about it. If there's this certain sense of humility and respect, it's that interest in versus taking from, I think, which is... Um, so, yeah, lots of guys will turn up and turn around and go, I'm just going to sit on the side here and have a quiet little pray. Is that all right? And 
I hope you people get it. And do whatever you want. But it's the ones that come in, boots first, and start picking flowers, trying to dance with the other dancers. It's that, yeah. And, and that attitude, that assumption exists because of this kind of rhetoric within New Age that the Hopi are the one, the saviors, and that if you can, you know, the Hopi itself became a, a pilgrimage point where people would turn up from around the world and just go, I'm here, I've made it. And everyone going, great. <laughs> Um, what are you going to do now? Yeah, that's it. It is, because there's nothing to do. <laughs> so yeah, yeah, there is a, a remarkable similarity between the kind of information that anthropologists were after for quite a long time, and the reason why I got told not, that I would, would not be allowed to do my research as an undergraduate. Um, it, yeah, it's exactly the same sort of information that New Ages are seeking. So yeah, yeah, definitely. Um, you, you, uh, I accept you're kind of limited in that you're just looking at one particular regional uh, area, but could this not, you mentioned this particular case of man turning off the shotgun, and you say this is a result of misunderstanding of uh, an indigenous culture. Could you not fit this into a wider framework, though, as opposed to just misunderstanding one individual culture, of actually a reaction to, um, if you put, uh, egoistic modernity, um, in that you have the same kind of process happening with the appropriation of one's own culture. I mean, you can look at uh, Marilyn Manson, for instance, um, not Marilyn Manson, um, Akiman in uh, Guyana, what was his name, Jamestown. Uh, Jim, yes. Jones. Jim Jones. Yeah. Jim Jones. He based a lot of his thinking on Christian theology, and I'm sure I could cite a few people in our um, country here that are doing the same. So could you not kind of is it supposed to be based on a misunderstanding, it's based on a reaction to individuals from Dermot? Yeah, I think so. And I, I think we've kind of very briefly mentioned the idea that the New Age is a product of and a reaction against modernity, without a doubt. And there are so many strands within that. And <coughs> Christianity itself, you know, the idea there's some lovely work on Christ Aquarians. Which is this kind of Christian New Age movement of, of Aquarianism and Christianity in this kind of mode. And that's quite interesting because my father in law is one. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but yes, yeah, it's very above. Or on gem based, but I'm not going to say. Um, yeah, is the answer. It's, it's, it has uh, savings within with the various other communities and uh, within. You know, modernity as well as kind of indigenous societies around the world. I guess, I guess the natural conclusion of that question is though, could, I know it's only what you're proposing per se, but could actually any increase in contextual knowledge, would that actually change anything within the New Age community or are they somewhat choosing for it to be the mystic other? There is a romantic, romantic idea of the mystic other that's very appealing. Um, and reality often challenges that and so as to how much you want to challenge that I can't say but I can see the appeal of it I can see the appeal of, of, of just defining something that I want it to be not what it actually is and so yeah for sure um, within the new age itself it's so diverse that yeah, you're going to get somebody that if they're presented with the reality picture and, and, and pointing out for what harm has actually been done, they're going to step back from it a little bit. Others might not. Others might just want to keep on to that romantic idea of, of what the other is. So yeah, I don't think there's an answer here. And this is, again, the apology for being an anthropologist. <laughs> I can't go, yes, let's educate the masses and tell them what dicks they're being. Um, I don't think it work. And it's not our job. It's our job to, I suppose, throw out the, the questions and let people sort out themselves. You mentioned that the oh, sorry. Okay. You mentioned that the complexity of their kind of hierarchy or superior mm. you, was that obvious to them or would they oh, have to yeah. take a while finding out if they met somebody they hadn't known before? No. It was yeah, it it was crazy. And I'd sit down with Mike and he would work with his this kind of artist um compatriot guy called Delbridge and they sat there one time and tried to explain the different ways in which they were related to each other 
and in because a lot of the religious societies you have kind of a, you're adopted into it so that but they use familial terms so it's you're my uncle or you're my father or you're my son uh, your um, so Del and Mike sat there one night right in terms of clan we're not related but because he's my he sponsored my son in this religious ceremony so I'm actually his uncle but he is married to my sister's Blah, blah, blah. And so they sat there and all these strands started coming together. And it was, well, all right. <laughs> and I just started trying to scribble it down and write diagrams and put boxes together and replace it. And they go, right, what actual <coughs> impact does it have on everyday life? And they went, oh, on everyday life? No, nothing. <laughs> <laughs> but we know all those strands, so that when it comes into the context that it is in play, then they can act accordingly. So, so it's, they, know, they know everybody, so they know what they are. Met another hope they didn't know. Is that more complex? Pretty much so. I mean, like, so, I mean, I've only lived here 20 years, <laughs> but, but every time you join a club or go swimming or something, you know somebody who knows somebody who knows you. Um, and there's only six and a half thousand hoping people on the reservation, uh, so most of those people will know or be related to most other people, uh, and they they kind of know where they sit in relationship to any one of those strands. So yeah, and if not, it's a it's a quick conversation, and it and it gets kind of teased out. That happy enough. By the way, congratulations on spray applicating as well as educational land. Interesting. <laughs> <laughs> Not easy to do. So the long lost my brother, and are they still looking? Um, how are they recognized if, if they are looking for them? It's a, again it comes back to this you find two hobbies agreeing with each other. Right. With a mythical character that is so potent and so powerful, there were a range of reactions to it. I, I was quite interested in this as well, like how would you recognise it? And there's, there's been an increase in Christianity at Hopi, so a fair few Christian Hopis would say, right, well that's easy, Jesus was the one white brother, and he's, he's been a God, we've got him, it's sorted, we can carry on now. Um, other people would refer to it as um, white people arriving in general, so the advent of European colonisation, that was the long lost white brother and they've kind of paused it up a bit. Um, other people would say it was still waiting. Uh, so a lot of the prophecies in particular have been connected to some of these, this rock art, rock art. <laughs> yeah. Um, so as yet there is there's one called Prophecy Rock and a uh, depiction of that rock has been um, utilised to great um, it, yeah, within the New Age movement you can get kind of pictures of this prophecy rock you can get little bangles with it um, you can get it as a screensaver uh, and it, it oh, dusting off the cobwebs now I can't recall precisely the interpretation of it but I think there's it's the two world wars I think there's um, the Pahana again is in there somewhere. There's a, a point at which you know Hopi life kind of is doing all right, and then just cat cataclysmically just ends. Um, and there's other people that say no, it's a picture of the first train that went through the desert. <laughs> and so yeah, it, it, yeah it, the interpretations of it are, are great. Well,
But that's it, and it's a difficult one to kind of judge, as I suppose the easiest thing for me to say is I, I went to Hobie very sceptical of the whole notion of New Age appropriation of hopiness, but I came back with that attitude slightly tempered, and I might not seem as much because I'm still quite cheeky about some of the wackier ideas. But there were guys at Hopi who turned around and goes, well, maybe we do have spaceships hidden underground. I don't know. You know, <laughs> it might not be my clan that's got it. It might be somebody else's clan. You know, one of those, you know, their clan. Like, they're always heightened on about stuff. So it's, it's difficult for, for me as an individual to turn around and go, like, an artistic interpretation of, of whether it's the dreaming or whether it's Hopi myth or prophecy. And, and that can be damaging or wrong. In any way, can I give it that authentic stamp and say, no, you know, doctor approved, that one's all right, that one's a bit shoddy. It, it's for all of us as individuals to turn around. But I think with the core, it comes down to is if, if the majority of the population that it's connected with turn around and disagree with it and say, no, we, we, we're not happy with the way that's done, then yeah. Because in a similar way, I think a certain opera company used Kachina dances in a performance and just appropriated all these ideas and myths and costumes and the hoping a few minutes about it. It's going to, you know, it's not for that context, it's, it's for this, it doesn't have any salience there. It's aesthetically, it's beautiful, but, you know, that's, that's not what it, it's all about. If that answers your question, I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. How do they avoid? How do they what? Like, uh, why are they allowing the tours to take, take place in the Hopi? Like, they don't believe. It's. Take back. Um. Yeah. The the New Age the woman that ran the, the yeah. New Age tour company, she associated herself with a woman who was who was brilliant actually. She was quite a feisty and very powerful woman. Um, socially when I met her a few times uh, and she, this woman Ro, had been told by the tribal council uh, that they'd asked for a bit of clarification on precisely what these people were doing when they came up and she turned around and goes it's none of your business you know it's mine it's a personal adventure um, and what she would do was she would sit them down give them some hokey food tell them a couple of hokey stories and you know on their way but the way it was packaged as a kind of new age tour to Hopi to sit and speak to a real medicine woman was, was quite cannily done. So she was almost playing the new age game a little bit herself. So that was almost a method of dealing with the new ages. And this came up a few times when I kind of skipped it a little bit with the, with the, with the roots of Hopi prophecy being bled out into non hopi society by this group of men and women that met just after the Second World War. This became a, a very political movement, the Hopi traditionalist movement. And a lot of, a couple of them were still knocking about, and this guy Martin, who's on the picture of the Hopi candles, Martin Gaswesion, where I went to see him, he's still knocking about. He's writing books on the end of the world in 2012 now. <laughs> um, <laughs> Did that Hopi would, would massively intertwine with that whole 2012 thing. Uh, but yeah, they were seen as as, as almost like a, a useful tool because when all the really whacked out people came up, everybody knew they were just going to go and see Martin or Roe or one of these others and it left everybody else to just get on with normal society. So it was almost seen as a kind of service to the rest of Hobies that these people would look after them. Um, so that's how they, they, because if you turn around and say, no, we want this to stop, this is in the front, then everybody's going to go, wow, that's interesting, let's go for it. Uh, so, yeah, that's how they deal with it, generally. Uh, come with you, uh, It's kind of connected. You mentioned that, like, they feel a lot of empathy for, like, new age visitors. Um, do you think that's because they see that, like, the new age culture is kind of a backlash to, like, modernity? Then... Like, do you think they feel this empathy because obviously their culture isn't providing enough? I think it's um, a recognition that in, in certain sections of modern society there will be people who are demanding 
and I used the, the term authenticity quite a lot, something authentic. I never found out what it was about Hugby that was authentic, but I found out a lot of things that were inauthentic. And so if you could say that there was something that was inauthentic, you could kind of buy, you know, I did say, well, right, there is something that is authentic. I just couldn't define it. So yes, um, there is. there were a lot of, a lot of discourses about it. So there were a lot of artists that kind of connected to kind of universal ideas of humanity within Hopi. Um, there were a lot of people that understood how a lot of other Native American communities had historically kind of become disconnected and they were on a quest to find some sense of identity as well. So yeah, Hopi, being Hopi in the 21st century is difficult and weird place to be and young younger generations in, in particular are trying to connect with something there but they're not quite sure where it is because most of being Hopi is, is old men. It's sitting around, it's talking Hopi and Hopi is a slow and long and laborious language to learn and to speak and it's just, you know, and being in a ceremonial position of responsibility is a long and drawn out place and so I met a lot of younger Hopi kids that were going like, can't we just be Navajos because they've got guns and drugs and gangs. <laughs> but this is a real problem, you know, what the, why, why be Hopi? Why be Hopi in the 21st century? So that, yeah, so there's this, there's all these layers going on and yeah, definitely a recognition, there is a sense of disconnectedness within other uh, social contexts that they can kind of understand and relate to a little bit. Does that answer something? A certain sense of, of, of tolerance. Um, the there's the sort of Mormon population uh, at Hobie or around Hobie. Um, I remember rightly. Yeah, a certain sense of tolerance, but also a kind of. Um, I suppose joking and gossip as well. Gossip was quite a powerful tool at Hopi for kind of um, bringing people in line. Um, an understanding that if you can still be a Hopi person and still be a part of the community and still partake in social events and reciprocal relationships with other members of your clan because you still have that clan. You know, being a Christian doesn't take that clan identity away from us. Um, so there was that, there was this a certain level of tolerance towards Christianity, but there was also, and I never saw it in direct relationships to Christianity, but I did see it in relation to things like ethnicity, um, of being not quite as hopey as me. <laughs> and that, that came across in different ways, so yeah. Uh, or, or living on the reservation. So I mentioned that, you know, 6,500 people left on the reservation, but there were 11,500 Hopis. And when a lot of these people came back at the weekends for their responsibilities, you know, I, I was living with a guy and he turned around at the weekend and go, like, these city Indians don't know shit about what it's like to live here all the time. You know, they're kind of part-time Indians. Uh, so there's all these uh, discourses going on at the same time. Um, or, you know, some of the half-bloods up here are more Hopi than some of the full-bloods. It was a weirdness. So, because there were so many aspects of Hopi identity and religious ideas being just one of them, then yeah, there were conflicting moments around it. Sorry, does that yeah. muddied everything up there? <laughs> do, do you not say that Christianity is the biggest threat in New Age? No. Is Christianity not trying to change them completely, not just borrow their own name? Yeah, well, there's urge Christians, but I think what's happened, it's more of a of the, the direction it's coming from. So New Age is coming in and wanting to grab everything and the Hopi is saying no. Whereas Christianity is kind of there, it's going, look, we're here if you want it. And some of the Hopi is going, yeah, alright. So if, if Hopis themselves are saying, yeah, we'll be a part of this, then it's not up to any of the other Hopis around them to really turn around and go, no, we've got to stop this. Having said that, Pueblo Revolt of 1680, quite a few Hopis killed quite a few Catholic priests. 
but I'm, I'm not going to go into that one. Um, so yeah, this is an interesting uh, I just thought story. That a lot of maybe evangelical would see it as an easy target almost because of the... They're kind of evangelical proof for a lot of Hopis because they'll just sit there and smile sweetly and agree with whatever you say and then ignore you. Uh -huh. um, which is, yeah, beautiful. So, uh, and they have an incredible way of diverting. I was sent around in circles and circles of the next person is the person you want to be speaking to and you can't find the next person who's going, oh yeah, I'd love to, but you know you should really speak to is him and you go, oh, I'd be able to see him. <laughs> oh yeah, no, this is brilliant, you should go and see her. Okay. And it took me two weeks to realise I was just walking around in a big circle <laughs> around the same place. Uh, but yeah, they got me the same time. Yeah. Oh, no, Sorry, so, okay. um, I was just wondering, um, so if you could clarify a little bit how contemporary younger generations in the whole community would cope with, you know, on the one hand, um, the disenfranchised urban Western people who would, you know, in their frustration and appropriate elements and all that, um, but how, what their current spirituality or you know, as a people who is uh, you know kind of relegated and in a reservation, and mm -hmm. also because they are portrayed as the indigenous other and all of this, how exactly do they struggle <coughs> against that? Like, if they have any actual discourses they use or yeah, the strategies is quite interesting. Ones. Um, there's a, there's a scholar uh, Hartman Lomoaima who was Hopi. He ran the museum down in Tucson. University of Arizona, is it two something? Um, he referred to this this kind of these very particular strategies throughout history in fact of hopification, of kind of absorbing stuff, giving it a slightly hopey twist and saying, yeah, it's hopey <laughs> brilliant. Um, and one of the ways in which I noticed it amongst a group of teenagers was we were sitting with it was myself and about four or five other graduate students from the University in Flagstaff sitting around um, after we'd been out clearing fields and stuff and just there was a group of us students and a group of teenagers and a group of old men and um, it was great. Uh, and then one of the graduate students was really interested in clan identities and how young people would identify with that. So she went around the, the room and said, oh, which clan are you, which clan are you? And it's a bit of a weird question to ask, but it's, it's you know, it was accepted. And so when there's a bear clan or, you know, Rodan clan or whatever, and this guy at the end, big black leather jacket and skulls all over his t-shirt, and he just went, I'm Black Widow clan. <laughs> <laughs> and she went, you mean Spider clan? I went, I know what I fucking mean. <laughs> so, <laughs> given, there is no Black Widow clan, there is a Spider clan, but he had, like, modified it, he'd given it that, that value that he wanted. So he knew the responsibilities of being within the spider clan, but it wasn't quite dark enough, so he made it Black Widow clan. And, and that's it, that's real, you know, he did it. So there's ways of ascribing value to elements of Hopi society, of, of those kind of building blocks of, of identity. Um, so whether it is the language or the farming or the religious, it's, it's kind of trying to almost convince the young people that they want to be a part of it. Uh, but, you know, they're the ones that are going to make it and mould it into the, the next version of happiness in, in the next sort of 20, 30 years. So, yeah. I'm just going to ask if uh, I hope we have sort of capitalised a bit on the New Age and if they maybe encouraged contact with New Age to, you know, for economic benefit. Not so much for economic benefit, but um, definitely for political motive. So, Within the Hopi traditionalist movement, yeah, there was a definite kind of, uh, of need of uh, reaching out to the uh, to various New Age people. To raise their profile. Yeah, it, it, it was it resulted in quite a lot of uh, reaching out to quite dangerous people. And then I spoke, I wrote about certain guys who were pretending to be Hopi and ending up giving talks. One guy who's now back in Glastonbury, I think. I call Roy Stevens, who's actually from Indonesia and is claiming to be Hopi and calling himself Roy Little Son. But he um, set up a commune on one of these uh, at Hopi, uh, and the guy who ran, who owned the land there was a guy called Titus, and it became known as Titus's Farm, and quite a few people came and, and stayed on the reservation. Uh, 
despite being asked to leave several times by the Hopi police. But Titus became quite ill and Roy um, decided to take over his care and just put him on a macrobiotic diet and basically killed him. Um, and Oh, no, nearly killed him. Get your facts right. <laughs> <laughs> nearly killed him. He was rushed to hospital, and it was a direct effect of, of this guy just refusing all medicine and putting his care in this in this bloke, like, right? Um, so he's he's actually the only person you know I was told that I was warned about being sent off the reservation, right? But he's actually the only guy that has been picked up by the police and literally just taken away and told that he'd be able to get back and be arrested. So.